welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. So come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord together, if you will. And let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or hear from a woman, to hear from a black man or a white man or a brown man. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or a short man. We haven't come to hear, oh, thank God, from an old man or a young man. But we have come to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you all the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives this day. Father, we bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you, Father, for our Adventist brothers and Catholic brothers and sisters. We ask you to bless Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church and the Way Church, Lord. Just bless them as you would bless us and we'll give you the praise. You know why, Lord? Because we're all on one plan doing one thing to build the kingdom of God not a man's, but yours. May the glory of God go to you in every area. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say amen. amen. Well, go ahead and take your seat. Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. By the way, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is phenomenal. And you're not going to want to, you probably will, but you're not going to want to miss any of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. It is just power packed with great wisdom. And wisdom that you live by, wisdom that you understand and comply in your life. As you apply it in your life, you know what happens, it changes the world that you live in. And as we go to the word of the Lord today, I want you to pay attention, if I may, listen closely. This is a time for you to study the Word of God for the next few minutes. A lot of times, you know, the Bible says that we're study to show ourselves approved. We don't have time to study during the week. Husband and wife work, they work late, got kids to take care of, running kids back and forth, doing all the things. By the time night comes around, they're exhausted to get out and go through their lexicons and go through their uh, concordances and dig up the Greek and dig up the Hebrew. And to study is a very difficult time. At least do it in church. At least make this your Bible study time. Every time you come to the Rock Church World Outreach Center, it ought to be a time of studying the Bible where you get to hear the heartbeat of God. Not that, now watch me now, not that you just learned the word, but you learn the word along with God's character, nature, and attributes. And that's how you will take in the very heartbeat of God and operate in the wealth that God has for you in every area of your life. Today, as we approach the fourth chapter of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept, powerful again chapter, but I want to give you a title if the message, if you're making notes, living out life in rest. You're going to live out life some way. You're going to be one of those people that are tormented all the time and be frustrated all the time. You're going to be somebody who's worrying all the time about everything. You're going to be somebody that's going to live out life and going to be, you know, at, have a temper going all the time and insecurities ruling your life. Or you're going to be somebody that operates in rest. It is so simple and so desired of God that you operate in the rest of the Lord. Oftentimes we don't know what that is. I will explain it to you in just a few moments, what the rest of the Lord is. But I want you to think about it just for a moment. You live all your life so that you could take times of rest. 
You live and work all your life trying to save money so that when you get older, you can rest from your labors. What kind of rest does God want you to be in day in and day out? How important is it to you? How important is it to God? How do you get it operating in your life so that you're not living a life that's totally and completely frustrated about everything that comes along? Let me read to you out of the verses, if I may. Verse number one through three of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. It says these words. The first word is therefore. It's therefore because of the previous verses, which are in chapter three. Remember, he was using an illustration of the children of Israel coming out of bondage out of Egypt. He used them as an example for you and I and the mistakes they make so that you and I don't make those same mistakes. They came out of bondage. God wants to take them into their promised land. The problem with it is, is they never got into their promised land. You and I can be a people who realize that God wants to take you somewhere. God wants to bless your life. There's your own personal promised land that God has for you, and he wants to take you into that promised land of the Lord. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm not talking about someday making it to heaven. I'm talking about while you're here on this planet. I'm talking about you walking in to the ways of the Lord that gets you into your promised land. We look at the children of Israel, they didn't get into the promised land. That's a shock. They could have, it was there for them. God wanted them there. God wanted to put them there. God wanted to take them there. God wanted to protect them while they got there. And yet they still didn't get there. They heard God. They knew God. They understood what God wanted for them. They saw it with their own idea, eyes, but they had their own idea about life. And they did what they thought instead of what God said. It's so easy for every one of us to do the same thing in faith in life. Because God wants to bless you doesn't mean you're going to get blessed. Because God wants to prosper you doesn't mean you're going to get prosperous. Because God wants to go before you, fight your battles for you, doesn't mean your battles are all going to be won. There's a part you must play. And here we find in the scripture the warnings that say if we don't do our part in this, we're never going to get into our personal promised land. So for all of us that are in here today, listen up. God has a future for you. You'll never get it unless you start to learn the principles of the word of the Lord. That's why it's there. It's been preserved for you for thousands of years so that you can look into the very heartbeat of God and see what's ahead of you, how to do and be what God would have you to do and be. So let's look at the word of the Lord together today. Listen closely as I read verse number one. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest. Notice these words, his rest. Didn't talk about your rest. If I was to ask you about your rest, Every one of you would say, well, rest to me is laying on the couch. Rest to me is having an extra hour of sleep. Rest to me is getting away to Acapulco or laying on the beach at uh, Cabo San Lucas or going to Hawaii, laying on the sand of Hawaii, doing nothing. That's real rest. Rest to you and rest to me is different than the rest of God. God wants us, listen to this, there's a promise that takes us into, notice the capital H in the word his, his rest. It's different than your rest. It's different than what I think rest is all about. Most of you, your rest would be having just a couple of days off, not having to work, not having the pressures of doing anything, just kind of crashing during it, just chilling out. You know what I'm talking about? Just chilling out and doing nothing. That's what you would call rest. But God doesn't call rest that way. God calls rest a different thing. And there's a different way to attain it that lasts. Listen closely. You can get into your rest. Have you ever noticed sometimes you go into your rest, come out of your rest, and you're more tired than you were before you got into your rest? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I went on vacation with my grandkids. I got 11 of them. I went on vacation with my grandkids. I was in hell. I want you to know something. And I was more tired after that vacation 
than I was before I started the vacation. I told Grandma, I said, Mama, I got to go and get another vacation to rest from my vacation. Uh, see, our ideas of rest are different than his ideas of rest. Now stop for a moment. What if I could share with you from the Word of God what God's rest is all about, that you can find it and adapt it and put it to work in your life every moment of every day? What if I could share that with you today? Is it worth you listening to? Because you worked all your life to enter into some form of rest. How do you know it's the right kind of rest? It's like going to Disneyland during the day. You come back at Disneyland, it's the happiest place on the planet until you hit the 91 coming home. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All the happiness is gone immediately and you'd like to get a hold of that little mouse and choke its neck. So he says it remains entering into his rest. Let us fear. Now listen to these words. He comes along and he makes this statement. He said these words. He says, let us fear least any of you seem to have come short of it. In other words, we need to respect the fact that we could miss, like the children of Israel, the rest that God has for us in our own personal promised land. Verse number two, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Wait a minute. They heard from God just like you hear from God, but they didn't do anything about what they heard. Did you know that most people attend American churches hear but don't do? Did you know that they hear but never respond? Did you know that we could hear the gospel just like they heard it and never get into our own personal promised land because we don't operate the way God would have us to operate? And he comes along and he says this, not being mixed with faith to those that heard it. And all of a sudden, something stopped them from going to the promised land. They really didn't believe. They really didn't see God as one who was going to come through. They heard it, but they didn't believe it. Verse number three comes along. Listen to what it says. It says, for we who have believed do we who believe do, we who believe do not just try, not just think about it, but we do, listen to this, enter what rest? That rest. Not your rest, not my rest, not my ideology or philosophy on how to do rest, but the rest that God has for us. Something I want to share with you, when you enter into the rest that God has for you, it is real rest. I'm not talking about dying, I'm talking about living. Here rests, not on a gravestone, but on a life. Are you hearing me? Here rests, not on a gravestone, but in our hearts. Big difference, are you hearing me? And the rest that we're talking about is entering into the rest that God has for us. Listen closely, I'm going to define the word rest for you. God's rest. Rest is not ceasing from your labors. Rest is the comfort of life because of the presence of God. One more time. Rest is not ceasing from your labors. Rest is the comfort of life because of the presence of God. You just know that you know that you know he's on the scene. And when he's on the scene, everything is going to be okay. No matter what your eyes see, no matter what your ears hear, no matter what you feel, you're going to be okay because Jesus is on the scene. And you can have that rest anytime you want. All you have to do is get off the problem, get off the trial, get off the tribulation, get off the worry, get off the anxiety, get off yourself and get on him. And most people don't understand that. You say, Pastor, if I get off of this reality, then I get on to him. Am I not like an ostrich that puts my head in the sand and buries it? My body is still exposed to the real elements that are out there. Can I say something to you? There's a big difference between an ostrich that sticks his head in the sand and a believer who puts his heart in Christ. Is anybody listening? And you and I are called by God to enter into his rest and his rest comes because of his presence. Amen. And you can bring his presence in wherever you're at. 
The other day I was shopping. My mom's 94 years old, so I shop for her every week. I go get her prescriptions. I don't want to do that. Is that okay if I tell you the truth? I don't like to do that. I'm much rather do something else. You know, but I'm at Albertsons shopping. You know, and when I go to Albertsons, I try to disguise myself. <laughs> Everybody there goes to the rock. And they say, Al 1, hi, Pastor Jim. Al 2, there's a prayer meeting. Al 3, there's tithes and offerings. <laughs> it's like, I'm, but I'm going down there. Instead of being an old sourpuss about it, there's something that happens to me when I turn the page and I get off myself and I get on him. All of a sudden, this quirky little smile is on my face. I feel like I'm the cat that ate the mouse. And I'll be going down the aisle doing something I don't want to do. And all of a sudden, I've got this smile on my face like the whole world is at peace. Why? Because it is. Why? Because I have now cast my care on he that careth. And by the way, casting your care on he that careth, not your relatives or your neighbors. The one that cares, his name is what? Jesus. And so for all of us that are in here, it's as simple as getting off yourself. If you're on yourself, if you're troubled, if you're constantly under pressure, if you're constantly under trial, if you're constantly uptight about something, here's what you're doing. Somebody needs to tell you, you have not turned the page to Jesus. And you can say, oh, I'm believing God. I'm believing God. Oh, no, you're not. Are you hearing me now? Now, look, here's what we need to know. And this is very important. How to bring in his presence. There are some things that you need to understand in order to bring his presence in. Number one, you got to know something. You have to know where real rest comes from. If you don't know where real rest comes from, you will always go back trying to find your rest in the stuff of this world, of the check that comes through the mail, or the pat on the back from the boss, or the uh, family that seems to be at content and peace for a little while. Have you ever known the boss will pat you on the back one day and yell at you the next day? It doesn't last, does it? You can have money in the bank one day, then you go to church and you don't have any money anymore. I mean, it never lasts, does it? So therefore, for guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to realize where real rest comes from, and it doesn't come from the stuff. It comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I've got to know it. If I don't know this, what I will do is I will constantly go back to my old ways. I've got to know it. I got to know it, not just in my head, but deep down inside of my heart, that it becomes part of my life, that when the pressures of life come, and trust me, my friends, they will come. I don't care how great a Christian you are. I don't care how long you've been preaching. I don't care how many verses you've got. I don't care who you are. I want you to know something. The pressures of life will come, and when they come, you can just turn the page and get your heart fixed on him. You have now gone out of the problem into the problem solver. When you get into the problem solver, it's over with. From that moment on, the deal is done. So simple. In Exodus, the 33rd chapter, here's God talking to Moses. He's explaining to Moses about how, you know, God takes him, right? Remember I told you earlier, takes him out of bondage with the Egyptians, and immediately he wants to take them into the promised land. He doesn't want them to hang out in the wilderness. God isn't trying to punish these people. God loves these people like he loves you and me. And he immediately wants to take them into the promised land. So he tells Moses, he says, Moses, uh, I'll be with you. In fact, he even tells Moses, Moses, uh, don't be afraid of the inhabitants. I'll send an angel to drive them out. You got to be kidding. God spoke to Moses. Then what happened? Moses listened to people. And when you listen to people instead of hearing from God, you'll get caught up. And can I just say something to you? They, so Moses does what? He sends out 12 spies. 12 spies. 10 come back with an evil report. We can't do this. There's giants in the land. Before your promised land, there will always be giants. 
Before your promised land, there will always be problems. And you have got to not be worried about the problems and see the problem, but you have got to see the problem solver. And when you take your heart and put it on the problem solver instead of the problem, there's no longer a problem in your way. Because what's too great for God? Somebody ought to say amen. So the 12 spies come back. 10 of them have an evil report. And because of the 10, they kept all of the children of Israel from doing what God had told Moses to do. You know what Moses should have said to them if he was a good leader? All of you shut up. God told me we're going, he'll send an angel. He proved it to you, you saw it yourself. We're going, that's the way it's going to be. Pack your bags. But he doesn't, he's a sissy. No one's ever said that to you. He's a sissy and he let the people get away with what God said to do instead of doing what God said to do. They ended up doing what they wanted to do and man, he ruined the whole thing. And he was kept out of the promised land. You and I can hear from God today, not do anything except what other people do and keep us from our promised land. You will hear from God today about your future and you can not respond to it at all or think it's for someone else or think it's too big or too great or whatever and never respond to it just like Moses who was a great man of God and a friend of God that God talked to face to face and he blew it with God and you could too. You can come into this house right now and hear the words of the Lord go in one ear and out the other and never respond say that must be for somebody else instead of for me. And when you take that attitude, you will never enter into your promised land and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth instead of playing church with you. Yeah, Are you hearing me now? In Exodus, go there with me. In the 33rd chapter, it says, verse number 13. It says, now therefore I pray, if I, here's, here's Moses talking to God, if I have found grace in your sight, show me how your, your, now your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. Notice all the capital Y's on the word yours referring to God. And consider that this nation is your people. So God speaks back to him, verse 14. And he said, in verse number 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you, wait a minute, my presence will go with you and I will give you what? Yes. Wait a minute, I didn't hear you. The, uh, my presence, here's God speaking to Moses. Moses, you're going into your own promised land. It's something I have for you. Now I want you to know something. There's, he already told him there's, there's, there's demonic things going on, but I'll send an angel to run them out. And he says these words to Moses. He says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you what? Yes. God could have said, I'll give you wealth. I'll give you prosperity. I'll give you whatever you want. He could have said whatever. He used the word rest there for a reason. So that you and I today, thousands of years later, can realize that where the presence of God is, is his rest. And you, every day, if you're born of the Spirit of God, have the ability to usher in his presence. And find every day the rest of God. Is anybody listening? Which brings that quirky smile on your face. <laughs> oh my, it's good. And you and I, all of us in here, every day look for situations in our life to find rest. Maybe it'll come through the kids. Maybe it'll come because my husband treats me right and loves me. Maybe it'll come because my wife is good to me and cooked for me. Maybe it's got, whatever it is, all of us, the wrong place to look. The place to look for your rest is in the presence of God and any time you stop from your labors and you get into this rest, that's what it's all about. Let me explain Sabbath rest to you. Let me explain that. Sabbath rest is a day that God sets aside so the people would cease from their labors and enter into a relationship with God. Listen to me. 
Sabbath rest is a reminder once a week what the other six days were supposed to be like. All it is is a reminder every week because we need to be reminded, stop, get off yourself, get out of that labor, get out of trying, get off yourself, get off the problem, and get into God. And that was a reminder every week. It was never intended to become a religious ceremonial ritual where people worship a day instead of Christ. Never. And that's what we missed oftentimes is we end up worshiping a day instead of worshiping the one who created the day. You think God would be more interested in whether we cease from our labors or whether we have loving, personal, trusting relationship in him. You tell me what you think. Doesn't take a lot of insight on theology to realize God cares about the in-depth heart relationship. Every day you can cease from your labors. I didn't mean you stop working. I'm not saying you don't go to work. I'm not saying you don't do anything. I'm just saying you find your rest in the Lord. Come on, somebody. Are you getting it? Second thing on how to bring in his presence is you got to really want it. Because you can know something and not want something. I can know about Jesus on the cross at Calvary. I can even preach it because I know it doesn't mean I want it enough to get it. I can want something and not know how to get it. It works both ways. And once you know, you've got to want. And a lot of times we know stuff, but we really don't want it. I think it was a week or so ago we were ministering and about the leper who really wanted Jesus to touch him in the eighth chapter of Matthew. And he falls down before the face. He worships his face down on the ground and he's pleading with Jesus. He's begging Jesus to be healed. If you will heal me, he says. And Jesus comes and says, I will heal you. How did he get his attention? It's a heartfelt relationship. What if he just stood behind a tree and yelled, Jesus, if you're up to it, I'm over here. Big difference, my friends. What you really want with God, you really get. Are you hearing me? It's going to take a not only knowing, but a wanting his presence. In fact, right there, you're in Exodus 33rd chapter. Go with me to verse 15 this time, and let's take a look at it together. In Exodus 33rd chapter, verse 15, and when he said to them, if your presence does not, here's Moses talking about, go with us, do not bring us up from here. In other words, he's really wanting the presence of God. He knows in the presence of God is the rest of God. For how then will they know that that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? Moses is saying, God, don't send me. Don't send the people unless you go. How will anybody know unless you go? In other words, he's saying, I need, I want your presence. Because in your presence is his rest. So two things you've learned. You got to know where real rest comes from. Two, you got to want real rest. Enough to get off yourself and to get onto him. And casting your cares on he that cares. Third, I love this one. How do you bring in his presence? By faith. In fact, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse three says it like this. For we who have believed do enter that rest. We don't just enter a rest. We enter that rest. 
What rest is that? The rest that is real. The rest that activates God. The rest that makes things work. The rest that opens doors that no man can open. The rest that closes doors no man can close. The rest that stops the oceans from flooding the land. The rest that spoke and planets exist. The rest that holds the moon at its right access. The rest that holds the sun at its right distance. It's faith in God Almighty. And faith means you don't see this all the time. Remember what the Bible says about faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It means I don't really see this. What I see is failure. What I see is giants. What I see is I can't make it. What I see is I'm not smart enough. What I see I'm not talented enough. What I see is I'm not gifted enough. What I see is the reality of this world. But there's something that goes beyond the reality of my sight, smelling, and hearing. Here's what it is. It's faith in God Almighty. That my God can come and make it work. Without that, my friends, we fail to enter into the promised land. Here's what we do if we're blessed and lucky. We get to exist on this planet when God had so much more for you to do. Faith. Jesus is moved by a man in Matthew, the 8th chapter. You might as well go there. Let me tell you a little story about this guy. This guy stops Jesus in his tracks. Now watch this. Jesus hears the words of this man and marvels. How would you like to say something to God that causes God's jaw to drop open. That's what marvel means. Oh. And this man says something to Jesus that shows his faith, that gets God to, oh my, marvel. Now watch this. That gets the answers to his request. Matthew, the eighth chapter, verse five. And when Jesus had entered into Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him. It's verse 6, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I, I will come and heal him. A centurion answered and said, Lord. Now, wait a minute. I would have said to Jesus, come on, hurry. He's miserable. Let's go. Now you're talking. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> if I was in San Bernardino, I would have said, hey, that's what I'm talking about. Let's go. <laughs> and the centurion answers and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servants, I say, do this, and they, they do it. That Jesus heard it, and he marveled. And he said to those that followed, surely I say unto you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. What made him see the great faith? was that Jesus was the answer. And you don't have to go up and down and come over and jump and shout. Jesus will take care of it if faith is in there. This guy wasn't panicking. He displayed faith. Listen to this. Along with rest. You don't have to do anything. Just speak. You have the authority. Jesus is backed off, verse 13, pop it up real quick. Listen to this, it's so marveled, Jesus, and Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed. Let me tell you something, the proof, you gotta hear this, are you ready? Are you, are you listening? You gotta hear this, listen to me now, listen, listen, listen. The proof of your faith is based on the rest of your heart. The proof of faith is rest. 
The proof of faith is not shouting, oh, I'm believing God. Here's the word, here's the word. I'm believing God. I'm right there. I'm believing God. That had nothing to do with it. The proof whether you're in faith is whether you're in rest and you've given it to God. Now watch. If you're worried and frustrated, can't sleep, full of anxiety, don't know how things are happening, somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, stop playing church, tell you the truth. You're just not in faith, and I don't care if you say you are. Because you can say a whole lot of words with God, and they're cheap. Here's what's not cheap. God sees your heart, and when your heart's at rest, you are truly in faith. When you have a confidence, when he is on the scene, the problem is now over with. And that's what faith is all about. That's what Jesus saw in this centurion. Three things we learned about bringing in his presence. Because in his presence is the rest that you want. You got to know where real rest comes from. Comes from his presence. You've got to want his presence. You've got to fight for it at times because the world wants to come back into your life. And number three, it's by faith. Everything in the world will speak at you contrary to what you're believing. But your rest is in him because he's a great and mighty and marvelous God. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? I want to make sure all of you are right with God. I want you to answer the question. Nobody will answer the question better than you. But I don't want you just to hear what I'm going to say. I want you to actually think about the answer. You know, it's all right to check yourself out from time to time. The Bible says you should do this. Make sure you're right with God. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer it in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Is that okay? Here's the question. If you're to walk out of this building and you head towards your car and your heart stops and you die. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question. Now let's talk about your answer. Because your answer says a lot about where you're at with God. So let's talk. Some of you might have said, well, Pastor Jim, I think I would go to heaven if I died. I think I'd make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the scripture does it say you can be a positive thinker and get to heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you and love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I hope that if I died, I, I hope I'd go to heaven. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, it's not in the Bible, it says you can hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a whole lot. That's my answer. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you just don't understand. I'm really a good person. I think I'm going to make it because I'm pretty good. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. You're not going to make it if you think you're going to make it because you're good. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you before it's too late in your life. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. My answer is different than that. My answer is that my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child, put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck, had me baptized or christened when I was a baby. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say your mom and dad can tell you a Christian makes you a Christian. Put that religious jewelry on you, take you to those classes that you know bored your brains out, makes you a Christian. Nowhere. In the Bible, does it say that? Jesus says these words, and you need to hear them. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. There's only one way, and that's Jesus. You say, well, Pastor Jim... What is that way? Jesus tells us exactly what it is in John 3rd chapter. He says, you must be born again. Bottom line, for most of us that are Americans, when we hear the words born again, we don't like born again people. 
They've been portrayed by Hollywood movies, magazines, books, and everything as radical, crazy, fanatical people. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Hollywood has just skewed the thinking so that you won't respond correctly. Jesus said you must be born again. Let me tell you what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. But it's all or nothing, and I will prove it to you by the Scripture. Can I prove it to you? Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. Don't you know he is? He says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm or not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me define for you what's lukewarm. Lukewarm is a little in and a little out. A little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And can I tell you something right now? He'll never be something until you make him everything. And that's what this is all about. Always has been, always will be. It's your call, your choice, but that's the truth. You say, Pastor Jim, I know who Jesus is. Of course you know who he is. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas every year of your life. You celebrate Easter every year of your life. You know about the resurrection. You know about the baby in the manger. No doubt about it. You've sung the songs. But guess what? I want you to know something. You cannot get to heaven because of what you have in your head. It's not about what you have in your head. Look at me now. Look at me. It's about what you've done in your heart. This is all about the heart. And have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? You've got to give it to him. You know why? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. He could have made a trillion robots that look just exactly like you and all of them could come before him, worship and sing songs. That's not what he wanted. He wanted you to have a free will choice. Will you choose Jesus or not? Will you give him all of your heart or won't you? And it's your call. And whether you do or don't is your decision. But that's how you're going to get to heaven. You must be born again, Jesus said. So here we are in a safe, friendly place. We have sung songs. We have clapped. We have shouted. You are great listening to the word of God. Today is your day of salvation, a divine appointment you have with God today to get right with God. God brought you here today for this reason. I want you to enter into that rest, but you'll never enter into that rest until you're right with God in your heart and in your life. Then you have the right to enter into him and bring his presence into you. Today is your day. All across this auditorium, get ready to get right with God. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's don't do it my way or your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up all over this place. Back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, down at the Love Rock Cafe, put the burrito down. I'm talking to you right down there now. Get ready to pop your hand up. God's watching you. Wherever you're at, I want you to get your hand up in a minute and put it right back down. That's simple. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I'll feel funny. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel weird. Yep, you might. Get over it. It's better to feel weird in a safe place like this and feel funny and even be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you chose to worry more about what people see instead of what God sees. Today is your day of salvation. Don't let anything stop you from getting right with God right now. Today is your day. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Here it is. Are you ready? One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, two, one, two, 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 three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. Thank you. Back over here. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight. God bless you. Twenty-nine. Thank you. Back over here. Thirty. Thank you. Thirty-one. Thank you. Back up on top. Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. Is there ten back there? Is there about 10 back there? About 10 back there? About 10, 39, 40. Let's go back over on this side. Anybody over here? Anybody over here? Wave at me because you're all blending in together. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's like 30 or 40 people in the foyer. How about that? That's good. Don't clap. You're scaring my fish away. I'm fishing right now. I'm going to take you fishing and have you throw rocks in the lake while I'm trying to catch fish. Don't clap. There's another one, 41, right back there. Anybody else? There's 42, 43, thank you. Back in this family room, 44, 45, 40. Is anybody saved in this room? <laughs> oh, here's what I want you to do. All of, oh, I know they're all out there in the foyer. That's good. Get ready, foyer. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. Everybody get your stuff that raised their hand. Anybody that didn't raise your hand, slap yourself and raise your hand and get up here. In a moment, nobody leave. Let's let the people come. You come up here right now. I want to pray with you. Get up here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you guys. Come on home. Come on home. Come on home. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come home. I'll give you my soul. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. They're coming. Give them a hand as they come. They're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you can come too. Yeah, come on. Come on, you don't have to stay behind. Just get out of your seat and come. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Woo! Okay, all of you in front, I want you to look to your left. See this guy with a cute hat on? His name is Pastor Dave. He is a great guy. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. Two, he's going to give you some free information. Everybody loves the word free. The information is you take it home and read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. What does God expect from you? What does God want you to do now that you're a Christian? He'll give you that free information. Three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You heard of personal trainers? This is spiritual personal trainers. They'll meet you before church service, encourage you, pray for you, show you some scripture, free, buy you coffee, tea, not nachos, whatever you want. My goodness, get you back to church, help you to go on. You know why? Because your old friends will suck you down the toilet, but your new friends will help you get going with Jesus. We want to hook you up with some new friends. Is that okay? Only takes a few moments. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make the left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.